I have um, Jim here and also Beth. Uh, Jim and Beth, could you please um, unmute yourself? Um, Jim, it's the, yeah, there, there are. Right. Awesome, so that we works. have, um, we'll, yeah, it works, I can hear you. Um, Beth, can you say something? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, thanks, good to be here. Pleasure. Wonderful, thanks. Thanks, Jim, thanks, Beth. Um, um, so, uh, friends, um, uh, Beth Schmidt um, uh, works with the Recycling Partnership, and she's been really instrumental in bringing corporate uh, corporate um, partnerships to the Recycling Partnership. And um, Jim is um, the owner of um, RRS um, and um, is a co-founder of RRS, sorry. Um, and um, RRS has started a new program called Renew, um, which um, aims to bring more knowledge to decision makers um, and more, more tools to decision makers to create change. And uh, Beth's organization has been really instrumental in providing um, financing um, and grant money to um, uh, initiatives that require it. Um, so we're going to talk about, um, as part of the new systems for North America, we're going to talk about these two initiatives and you know how they are shaping uh, the future system. So Jim, could you um, first tell us a little bit about um, RRS, what you're doing with Renew? Sure, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk today. And hi, Beth, it's good to see you. Um, and hi. Ranjith, it's great to be able to uh, connect with uh, your community. Um, resource recycling systems, since uh, really since the early 80s, has been active in managing change uh, towards a more recycling-oriented economy. Uh, we initially worked very extensively just with the public sector. And then for the last 15 years, we've worked extensively also with the private sector, with corporate America at the brands level, um, at the markets level. And Renew is an initiative that's, um, while it's a year old in its branding, it is actually a um, initiative that is part of how RS sees change taking place uh, towards more recycling in our economies, here in North America, here in America especially. And Renew, from a, from a new, um, new place in the marketplace, is responding to uh, the challenging times that your previous speakers mentioned, where we really need to understand how important industry sponsorship programs like the Recycling Partnership, as well as many other types of programs, as well as the private partners in the recycling industry and the public partners in the recycling industry, those communities, municipalities, municipally run programs. And an important feature of Renew is just that we're bringing a very pro recycling message to the highest level of municipal decision makers at a time when the message out there is not, not very strong in the pro recycling side and instead has been introducing many many, if you will, backsliding messages, messages that while we want to think about them as messages about quality, have also, with the upheaval in markets, with the upheaval in some of the infrastructure, created a very uncertain marketplace around recycling, where indeed, we actually need to reinforce a very pro-recycling message, especially to the communities and their decision makers, their mayors, their city council people, county commissioners, that really rely on a strong, stable, predictable, successful, and highly effective recycling service in order to meet their goals. And that's really what Renew is about, is matching voluntary initiatives from the industry with municipalities who have this vision of excellence in their recycling program. And that's kind of the main focus. I'm sure we'll talk about more details later. Great. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, Beth, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, um, we've discussed about this earlier. You know, we we're going to talk a little bit about the nonprofit side of uh, the recycling partnership and how nonprofits play a role. And with Jim, we'll talk about collaborations. And I think it, we'll talk about that with both of you. But uh, Beth, can, can you give us an idea of what the recycling partnership is doing and how you're shaping the future? 
Sure. Um, first of all, thanks so much for having us. It's really good to be here today and to uh, to visit with um, all the guests across the world who've joined you today. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, well, I became personally involved and engaged in this problem in the industry um, during the course of a career within the aluminum, um, in, in my career during uh, many years in the aluminum industry, uh, when I worked on recycling issues and tried to work to get more feedstock back into our um, organization and into the industry um, across the board by increasing the recycling rates for uh, various aluminum products. And a good portion of my time was spent um, sort of looking at the challenge across the system and recognizing that it is a challenge. And um, over the course of that uh, time, um, it became clear that an organization that reached across all um, the parts of the system, I'm getting a little feedback. Can you hear me okay still? Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, if, if you can hear me, I'm good. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, the uh, recycling partnership came out of um, a broad array of industry efforts, some of which uh, Jim and your staff was organizing, helping to facilitate, uh, that, that recognized that a voluntary industry consortium uh, could work across all sectors of the recycling system in the United States to, um, to, to bring uh, change and improvement at scale and to try to increase the opportunity from an infrastructure standpoint for more residents to recycle within communities across the country. And then secondarily to also help them um, recycle right and to recycle the right way to reduce contamination and to keep programs healthy. And so um, the Recycling Partnership is a national nonprofit uh, really focused on um, an overriding goal to help every family in the country recycle and recycle well um, with a, a, a stretch goal to double the recycling rate in the United States and um, divert um, more than 20 uh, million metric tons of material, uh, reducing greenhouse gases and creating really valuable feedstock for the industry. And some of the um, previous just speakers have talked about this already. Obviously, um, there are communities across the country who are really struggling, but there are also industries really struggling to get enough feedstock. And I think that's one message that I think we need to continue to try to hammer home as, um, you know, negative perception, negative um, stories in the media around how some communities are struggling uh, with the message that recycling is broken. I think our message, it would be that recycling is not broken, that there are companies um, all across the country employing um, over 500,000 workers uh, who are hungry for clean, valuable feedstock to, to make into new products. And so um, making sure that we connect those markets with the communities providing that feedstock is really what we're all about. Right. Um, Jim, I saw you um, shaking your head vigorously. Um, to bet. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? Said? Yeah, it, bl it blends some of Beth's comments with actually some of the closing comments from the prior speaker where we were talking about measurement. And I'm a big advocate of actually thinking about the quality of the material that that industry wants recovered. And that's really a commodity by commodity struggle. Every one of the industries that we work with, whether it's polyethylene, polypro, fiber, cartons, uh, food service packaging, um, you know, business waste, all of them want material that our recycling infrastructure uh, needs to deliver in higher and higher and higher quantities. And that's really where the, for example, the approach that TRP uses to really solidify the infrastructure at the curb to solidify the infrastructure in informing, educating, and working with the communities is an important gap here and that is being filled very, very well. And at the same time, what we're finding is that market pull uh, and the formula, the business model for the MRFs is struggling right now at a time when that needs to be much stronger. So um, I'm, I also want to just reinforce, A, that there's a very healthy infrastructure out there that has some issues right now, but there's lots of good success stories. They don't get the kind of airtime they should, 
Uh, and in some ways, that's the way those people want it. And that's why they're succeeding right now is because they've really just paid attention to the details, paid attention to running good quality sorting programs, matching up with good markets, and, and reaching high recovery levels. So I just want to reinforce the point that a lot of what's needed is more recyclable materials, and they are going to come from municipalities. And again, that's really where Renew is trying to make that clear point to an elected official that their leadership is needed now, perhaps more than ever. And sometimes that leadership can be very, very simple nod to their staff about how important that work is and some messaging out to their community about how important the need to keep recycling is despite what they might see in the press or the stories that they might be seeing. So Renew has been in an element of bringing that voice into the leadership um, uh, uh, associations, uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, where unfortunately there haven't been enough voices that are basically about good quality recycling programs. And that's really what the Gap Renew is trying to fill in terms of keeping those people of those decision makers focused on success and to know that the industry um, collaborations are there to help that success happen. Right, great. Um, I have so many questions for um, the two of you. Uh, this always happens towards the end of um, sessions, but I'm going to go one by one so that we have enough time to cover um, all of them. Um, uh, what you mentioned about you know um, helping leaders just give that nod to their staff. I think that's really important, and I think that that's where you know what BWS Vice believes that you know change can come from any part of the society, especially leaders or someone who takes the next step, not really someone who has the title of a leader. So um, I really agree with that. Um, and Beth, um, something that uh, we've talked earlier during our test run is um, you coming from an aluminum um, background is really interesting because. Um, as um, as you might know, aluminum is one of the most recycled materials in the waste stream. Um, so you're coming from a point where you work with the material which is most recycled and you're working with the recycling partner where you're focusing on all kinds of recyclable materials. So uh, what's your perspective? How has your experience been there? Um, there have been a couple things that are, as you, as you bring this up, that I think that are observations I would add. Um, uh, despite the fact that aluminum has is is widely perceived as recycl recyclable and that there's a very high recycle content in most aluminum containers, um, there still is a, a huge disconnect in some markets um, that ha even that have adequate infrastructure for collection. Uh, we started a a new uh, way of measurement uh, that we refer to as a capture rate. We do capture rate studies in communities that we work with. Uh, began this in earnest uh, with three city partners last year, and in every one of them, whether they were a high performing you know major city or a lower performing major city, we found that on days when recycling and trash are collected side by side, even in communities where there's an infrastructure there there still was a gap in um, behavior among some of those residents with something as recyclable as an aluminum can. There were, you know, maybe uh, close to 60% of the um, aluminum was still ending up in the wrong bins in some communities. And so I think that uh, reinforces the need th that um, we advocate when we work with community partners that uh, harmonize clear education for residents is something that's an ongoing process. You can't put a bin on the street or just put a label on the bin and expect consumers to do the right thing. I think having that ongoing messaging and a consistent message for them, even with something that's ubiquitously recyclable as an aluminum can is, is, is one observation that has, was, has been an aha moment for me. And, and uh, many of the uh, corporate partners who work in the metals uh, sector have, have, uh, found that to be um, a, a fact that has uh, led to continued work to recover additional uh, metal containers in some markets. And then the second piece of it, um, which is a completely different different commodity, but is a commodity where the, where the, um, the upstream uh, demand is really high is the fiber market, where there's a, a shortage in many regions of the country of good, clean quality fiber to create uh, whether it's corrugated boxes or other fiber products. And um, I participated in a, 
in a, in a circular economy tour, so to speak, with a fiber company that was working with a community that was on the fence about whether or not they should expand the infrastructure for their um, residents. And we, we took them from point to point to take them from the MRF where the residents are, where, where all the material is going to a fiber uh, mill, a, a, a paper mill, to a corrugated box uh, facility, to a fulfillment center that was using those corrugated boxes back into the e-commerce stream, all in one um, really closed loop within the uh, just a few miles of this community that was considering this. And it was an aha moment that I guess I would piggyback on what Jim was saying earlier, having elected officials understand that uh, recycling is obviously great for the environment and residents want it, but recycling is, a, is a, at its essence about getting good, clean manufacturing feedstock. And it also creates jobs and having that um, story told to them in a physical way was really a, quite powerful. I was really lucky to be able to, to join that um, circular economy tour. And it was something that I think reinforces what Jim said earlier. It's really um, one thing that we found common in all of the high performing communities that we've uh, studied over time is that having leadership committed and having buy-in at the very top of the, um, at the government structure is really critical. It doesn't necessarily need to be an ordinance, although that may be certainly helpful, but having committed leadership is, is super critical in terms of um, ensuring that a community performs at a very high level. Right, great, that, that's really useful. Um, uh, I mean, um, when we're talking about the problems um, with previous speakers and even um, now, it just feels like the problems and the challenges are so big. And this is a topic that we've covered in our uh, Pioneers and Changemakers series where we are talking to changemakers and trying to understand in, when problems seem so big, um, how do you, you know, go ahead and with chipping away at the problem one you know, day by day? And I think something that I can't forget is um, what Robert Egger had to say about this um, is that, you know, we're all uh, involved in consistent incrementalism, you know, shaping away the problem every day and that. And so, I mean, we are approaching this very positively, most of us, and the two of you are change makers. So, Jim, um, I want to ask you, you know, who are other organizations or associations that you're working with at Renew, um, you know, you're collaborating with at Renew to, you know, to move ahead. Sure, and, and I'll feature um, two amongst a wide range. Um, and one is a perfect example of that incremental change over time. The Carton Council of North America, and these are the companies that manufacture milk cartons, juice boxes, companies like Tetra Pak, Evergreen Packaging, Elo Pak, et cetera. These, these particular uh, entities collaborated in a voluntary industry partnership here in the U.S. to lift their recycling access rate. Uh, the households that can have access to carton recycling um, right at the curb, right at a drop off, that back in uh, when they first started out with us eight years ago, nine years ago, was only 18% of the households across the, uh, across the country. Um, they're now at 60 plus percent, around 62.7, I believe is the latest. And that all happened household by household, community by community, MRF by MRF, um, with roughly about a 5% lift every year. Um, some of the things that are part of their approach is a successful formula that's market driven. Let's make sure there are really quality and markets for these materials. Let's make sure that the recycling facilities essentially have a business case for the investment that might, might be needed. And let's help them with that investment in some cases where that capital hurdle can be too much for some of these recycling facilities, especially in these tight times. But then most importantly, it's also getting the communities themselves. And again, that's where a lot of this initial work with industry leaders and community leaders took place is through this Carton Council formula where we began to understand that when a mayor says, I wanna make this happen, it'll happen really quick. If a staff person says this is a good idea, it might take anywhere from a few months to a few years. And that's really where we saw the power of the elected official in terms of establishing direction and, and leadership and momentum. But that formula is a formula for change that clearly is bit by bit 
And the Carton Council showed that it can, in fact, be very effective. You have to be patient. It's a long haul. You and I talked in our earlier call about the meeting people, meeting communities, meeting industry, where they're at, where are those growth edges that each one of these places, some are lead with policy, some lead with a great MRF, some lead with a great community education program. Um, there are all kinds of successful formulas at the local level. The second example is the Food Service Packaging Institute here in the US where they also have in their members, a wide range of members that we all shop with and buy from all the time um, to make sure that as something as simple as the pizza box or the, um, the paper cup or the plastic cup can actually make it into a recycling program. And again, very much paying attention to a formula for success that looks at end market pull and then supply push, making the supply available, making sure the markets can take it, and then working with the communities and MRFs to have these actual changes made incrementally, step by step in their particular markets. And again, these are long hauls, uh, the years and years and years of effort. And that fundamentally is part of how things operate here in the US where maybe there's some state structure, but not always. Maybe there's some regional or county structure, but not always. And so we're always working with whoever is able to show that they can make change happen at either the local, regional, or state level. Right, great. Um, um, I want to, want to um, uh, ask, ask you, if you, let me just um, try to address that um, echo. All right, we don't have that anymore. All right, so um, I would like to um, ask both of you on how um, people can work with you um, because, um, but before we get to that, um, Beth, uh, we've talked about this earlier about the nonprofit model. Um, could, could you give us an insight into um, how that helps you uh, with your mission um, and, uh, you know, creating collaboration um, across people who will, entities who will otherwise be competitors? Uh, sure. Yeah. One of the interesting things about our model is that we do operate in a pre-competitive manner. In other words, um, whether it's retailers or consumer packaged goods companies or material suppliers who might compete very fiercely either at the store shelf or in the marketplace um, are all working together for the common goal because at the end of the day, all the materials are in the bin together um, and all the different brands are in the bin together or in the cart together, so to speak. And I think recognizing that we have a goal that is, is common for all the different components of the reverse supply chain that makes up the recycling industry is, um, is, is really um, a powerful uh, tool and, and is, has helped all of our corporate funding partners and other private contributors to recognize that we are all in it together with a, a common goal. Um, and and the, the, when we talk to people who might want to work with us, our uh, message is, you know, if, if you support our mission to uh, provide an ability for all Americans to recycle and to recycle well, if you support our mission and if you can work well with others, we'd love to have you, you know, working with us. And so if there are, um, viewers of this uh, session that are uh, within communities who would like to know a little bit more about that. We certainly have a, a broad array of technical support uh, staff who uh, could work with, uh, with communities. And if um, there are either private foundations or private companies or other individuals who'd like to uh, know more about the recycling partnership, they can certainly follow up with me. My role is re to really help us grow to the point um, that we can achieve the kind of scale that um, you referenced a couple of minutes ago and that Jim was talking about. Great example of the Carton Council working over time to recognize what needed to be in place to be able to get access to a critical mass of their um, end users, the end users of cartons across the country. Um, one other thing I would say about scale is um, even though there are not, there certainly is not a, a, a an effective federal approach in the United States. There are 20,000 different communities all managing recycling in their own way. We have really tried to work with groups of communities uh, to work within what we refer to as MRF sheds, you know, communities that all work together with one material uh, recovery facility who um, should be working on a common suite of recyclables. 
Um, in some examples, we're working with states, the state of Massachusetts, the state of Ohio. We're now doing some work with the state of Tennessee to try to bring a harmonized message. Um, Minnesota is another example where we're working to create a harmonized message that all the different communities can be um, using with their residents and that also are harmonized with what is actually collected at the material recovery facility. So plugging into those different parts of the system and bringing them together is really what our organization um, is, is doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with, with a goal to try to get to a scale that is not sort of naturally there in the United States. Um, that, that's great, Beth. Um, so next I'm going to ask um, Jim on how people can, um, who want to work with them can approach them. And after that, I'll ask uh, both of you on uh, how new systems uh, in North America might look like, how, what you think they might look like. Uh, but before that, let me just remind everyone that uh, my name is Ranjit Anipu. I'm a senior waste management consultant and I'm also a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. We have Beth Schmidt from the Recycling Partnership, and we also have Jim Frey from RRS. Um, um, and uh, uh, we, we're talking about new systems in North America today, and tomorrow we'll be talking about um, how North America and Europe are uh, facing similar problems, but the toolkit of solutions that they're employing are very divergent, very diverse, and how both sides of the Atlantic could learn from each other. Um, and uh, we have uh, great speakers tomorrow as well. So um, go to the website and register uh, for tomorrow's event. And with that, Jim, um, could you, uh, and one more thing. So there, um, I think we're already 30 minutes into the conversation. I mean, it goes really fast once you start talking about waste. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, use the live chat window before, uh, below the video stream and uh, post your comments and questions to us. Uh, Jim, could you tell us about how people could approach you? Sure. Um, in Renew, the initiative of RS that I'm speaking of is one of a wide range of programs that RS is actively managing in order to bring solutions to communities throughout the U.S. and, and abroad. And for Renew, if any of the listeners are um, in the public sector, municipalities uh, and the like, uh, state leaders, local leaders, et cetera, what we're really interested in, in is making sure that your elected officials who are your leaders, um, either because they have an interest in the environment, they have an interest in recycling, they're, they've shown that they can be leaders in that way, or because they hold the mantle of mayor, county commissioner, et cetera, make sure they're aware of Renew and can look for Renew in their, especially in their professional environments. Like I mentioned earlier, we'll be at uh, regional meetings, national meetings, state meetings of county officials, city officials, et cetera. And when they see Renew, they will then get that message about many of the industry collaborations that we've been hearing about and be able to essentially kind of grease the skids for that municipality or that city or that region to tap into the broad range of these, these measures. Now, the, the flip side of it is that that mayor might only have, just to use the mayor as the example, might only have a minute of their time during a two-day professional meeting. And during that minute, we want to talk to them about the broad Renew message that covers all the recyclables. And that's where I would then, if you're listening in and you're from a brand, you're from a agency that puts out packaging or product, that Renew is really a vehicle for making sure that that mayor hears about your particular needs as well, whether it's the types of needs like we've talked already, cartons, food service packaging, fiber, um, a variety of needs that the commodity-based packaging industry has to make sure that their packaging pro and products actually has a good home in the recycling system. And that's where we want to make sure that elected official Here's that broad pro-recycling message. Understand that that message is about the whole of the packaging waste stream that we're putting out there. And then that's really what our recycling system needs to be about. Both of these parties can reach out to Resource Recycling Systems, www.recycle.com. And you'll find our resources. You can also reach out to me directly. We have a staff of staff to answer questions. Jim, I think we have... 
some disturbance some disturbing in your audio. In your audio. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the last the last bit was uh, just to reach out to uh, Recycle.com or to me personally, um, and our staff can make sure that we get you information and get you plugged in. All right, great, wonderful. Um, um, Renew uh, reminds me of um, another initiative um, that we have um, interviewed last week. It's called the Initiative for uh, Municipalities and Mayors. Uh, it was started by the International Solid Waste Association um, and chaired by Philip Palin, who's a um, um, vice mayor, uh, honorary vice mayor of Antwerp, Belgium, and also um, uh, Mr. Sapir, who's um, in the who's also a deputy mayor at um, in Israel. So it's an uh, international um, co uh, collaboration. And um, based on what they're trying to do and what you're trying to do, there seems to be a huge need and potential for that kind of uh, messaging at uh, high level um, uh, decision making. And um, um, connecting this to what Beth said earlier about how um, you know there are thousands, tens of thousands of municipalities in the US trying to do different things. Um, I think this uh, this tells us that th th there is a requirement for tailor-made solutions. And this is something that um, you and I spoke about earlier, Jim, and also uh, something that was also mentioned by uh, in the interview with IMM, that there are different, each community is at a different stage and that we should come up with tailor-made solutions and help them with that to move ahead. So. Um, uh, with that, Beth, uh, do you have any, um, sorry, not do you have, but can you give us some insights on um, how um, uh, you think new recycling systems um, in the U.S. might look like, um, which parts of it are moving fast and, you know, uh, which st stakeholders are, you know, getting, bring, coming together? Yes, I think that uh, there obviously, and I don't know if this is exactly the question that you're asking, but uh, there's certainly a, a tremendous amount of interest from communities that are reaching out to us to um, understand what best practices uh, might be put into place to reduce contamination and to improve this the recycling stream within many communities across the country, um, particularly along the West Coast, where the markets have, have certainly been struggling, uh, but, but trying to... Um, work with them by deploying best practices that have been proven in other markets um, in order to try to get uh, that material that uh, material stream in better shape so that domestic markets can um, can continue to develop and can incorporate that as feedstock. Uh, so making uh, best practices available through, uh, you know, if you go to recyclingpartnership.org, you'll find that they, we have a variety of open source um, best practices and tools that are available to communities. Um, I think making um, those types of best practices available through open source models is something that we found uh, communities across the country are really hungry for. And so continuing to develop and uh, use additional resources, I think is, is gonna be um, very critical right now uh, because so many communities are facing, uh, you know, lower commodity costs and the importance of trying to um, make sure that the material coming through their system is of a quality that can um, meet the demands of domestic markets. Great. Um, thank you. Um, um, Jim, could you talk about how new systems might look like in the near future? And sure. Yeah. Sure. In, in addition to those mentioned by Beth, you know, and, and this focus on best practices is, is definitely needed. And some of the innovations uh, that are there uh, are, are scalable. And some of those um, meet in the, in the arena of engagement of the user. Uh, that capture rate that Beth mentioned earlier simply is measuring the ability of you know, every one of us to make the right choice with a PET bottle or a glass bottle or a, a newspaper, et cetera. And so how to reinforce that, how to motivate that, how to incentivize that, um, how to require that in some cases. And so one of the areas where I think we'll see more and more advancements in is the level of engagement of the actual user. I think we will see increasing participation by brands in that engagement process. Uh, certainly the recycling partnership is an example of that. We'll also see that at point of sale. We'll see more of it 
on the package, the unpack labeling, et cetera. We will see more of it in the digital interface, in the, the Facebooks and you know screen time that we all spend so much uh, effort at. And so that is an important part of the developing effort to motivate quality behavior. And one of the things I wanna comment on is that I'm kind of in, when we look at recycling facilities and we look at the citizen recycling, we wanna make sure that citizen knows not to put the truly contaminated materials in there, the bowling ball, you know, the, the food waste, the hazardous waste, the, the things that clearly should not be in a recycling bin. I'm a big advocate that the recycling facility is then the master of cleaning material, of sorting material, of preparing it for market. And we need to make sure those recycling facilities are tapping into some of this innovation in recycling technology that is requiring more capital, it's requiring additional investment, which we know is hard when market prices are down. But if you do want to prepare for successfully capturing the material that the citizen did put in the bin, which is actually really important, um, we think that that technology that includes a whole host of innovations around separation, around optical recognition, around visual, visual recognition, around robotic sorting, around improved hand sorting, around a wide variety of ways that that bale of material, that commodity, can actually be closer to the specifications that the market needs. The third area is one that is extremely important innovation, quote unquote, in the area of design for recycling, but also demand for recycled content. And this is again an area where some of the private, public private initiatives and the private industry initiatives are really working together to provide a voluntary opportunity for brands, for packaging companies to make commitments to buying recycled commodities that are gonna strongly increase the overall value stream and also make a convincing case to all of us that recycling is part of that circular economy, that it's part of that triple bottom line that is so important for our climate change goals, so important for our economic development goals. And especially if we think about and believe that at some point we'll recognize that we're in somewhat of a resource scarce future where we're using our resources more wisely. So these are innovations in three areas of that wheel of best practices that I think we'll see over the coming five years and 10 years. Great, um, thanks Jim. And um, you actually that provided a segue for my next question to Beth. Um, um, Beth, uh, you know, you're in charge of bringing partnerships from um, large, uh, you know, packaging goods companies. So um, what's their interest in, you know, investing in recycling infrastructure? This is something that we we are seeing happening um, in the US quite a bit and also globally. Um, where these um, large multinational companies are um, selling goods in areas where there isn't enough infrastructure to deal with the goods. Um, so they are, you know, getting engaged in this, but what, what's, their, uh, what's their interest? Um, well, I think that at the end of the day, or at the, at the beginning of it, the, the um, many companies are recognizing that um, through there's a tremendous amount of research supporting the fact that uh, the belief that consumers are demanding that uh, the companies that make the products that they use every day are responsible, not just with the contents of the, in terms of the manufacturing of the contents of the products that they use every day, but also the packaging that it comes in. Uh, now more than ever before, I think consumers are really demanding that um, the that the industries that supply lots of packaged goods um, are, are, are taking care of the end of life um, packaging at the at the end of its useful life, and for retailers, uh, retailers are recognizing that that they expect to be able to recycle the packaging that they use at the end of the the use after they've bought it, and so there's and and um, and so many many of them are doing what um, Jim um, mentioned, which is incorporating more recycled content into their packaging, but also providing other ways for feedstock to be used. And uh, for for example, the APR, um, Association of Plastic Recyclers Demand Champions program that uh, was kicked off last year, brought together a lot of companies who've committed to using recycled content 
throughout their uh, facilities and work in process uh, uses uh, to, to create demand for the packaging that's coming back through the stream, which is really a win-win. And that's something that we've worked with APR on. Um, and so designing packaging for recyclability and helping to create um, ways for their for residents to recycle their packaging at the end of its useful life is really just answering i think uh, answering uh, demand from consumers across the country uh, particularly younger consumers who have expressed a really uh, keen interest in making sure that packaging is recyclable i would also say that um, many companies are the um, you know there are billions of dollars of value created through the recycling industry and so many of our uh, member companies are actually needing recycled feedstock at the end of it and so creating um, a better supply chain for that material coming back through the system is also super critical for many of our members. Um, great, so um, I'll, uh, Jim I'll ask you the final question um, about um, uh, on one side uh, there is a huge need for um, re recycled material and on the other side there seems to be a huge gap there and uh, Natalie Starr from DSM Environmental earlier in our uh, in the earlier session um, has mentioned um, you know has done a um, inventory kind of not, not an inventory but a listing of all recycling reliant industries in Central Ohio. Um, so I'm just trying to understand um, this also um, is connected to another issue we, we discussed which is national level coordination for recycling. So my question will be around um, so isn't there a way in which uh, some uh, the likes of Alibaba or Amazon where you can easily find what the requirements of someone else are and connecting that that if that's happening at the national level that's a question for you but before that before you respond to that um, friends so we are in the final three minutes of the mm, first day of the global dialogue on waste uh, the 2018 global dialogue on waste you know uh, uh, so if you have any um, questions or comments you know use the live chat window um, below the below the video stream um, and also join us tomorrow uh, for a discussion on learning across the Atlantic on how US and Europe can le uh, learn from each other. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. So Jim, could you respond to that question? And then uh, I'll ask Beth to ha um, say any final remarks, uh, final questions. Final yeah, two, two items. One is, one is that there is a, um, a voluntary initiative uh, started by the U.S. Business Council for Sustainable Development that also has some national or international implications as well, and it's the materials marketplace. And, and it's not quite Amazon or Alibaba, but it is a, it is a you know, web-based um, forum for exchanging materials. To your larger point about leadership here in the U.S. and incentivizing that investment to produce quality material, some of the types of things that we're more likely to do in the U.S. is to incentivize the kind of capital investment that end markets can make to allow them to clean material that comes from MRFs and prepare it to their specifications. And these are the types of things we're likely to see to strengthen that, that connection between supply and demand. Awesome. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about that. Um, but maybe uh, next time or tomorrow for that matter. So sure. um, Beth, um, so could you, um, do you have any final comments or remarks that we haven't already covered? Sure, I would guess I would encourage anybody listening um, to learn more about what we're doing by either contacting me through um, as a follow-up or going to recyclingpartnership.org uh, to find out more. Um, if you are interested in joining our All In on Recycling campaign, we're really working to try to um, raise um, additional funds to get to scale in the United States. If you'd like to learn more about our mission and how you might want to get involved in the All In on Recycling campaign, please reach out to me. And I guess the final thing I would say, I know there's been a lot of really negative publicity about recycling across the country. Recycling is not dying. There are thousands of really healthy communities across the country uh, creating billions of dollars for the economy and you know, uh, half a million jobs in the United States. And so um, we are really working to try to get the word out around what is working and to help the communities that are struggling uh, get back on their feet and to uh, regain the health of the system and just appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Great, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so friends, I mean, that, that was um, recyclingpartnership.org. And then uh, we have Jim's website, which is recycle.com, which I think is the best domain ever. Um, you know, they got that domain for them. So I don't know how they did it, but that, I think a that's- A long time ago. 
<laughs> yeah, first thank move you. advantage. Um, so, uh, <laughs> friends, with that, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, for your patience, um, and uh, um, join us tomorrow and uh, follow Be Waste Wise for all um, upcoming events and knowledge dissemination. Um, you know, like we are talking, waste is a global challenge, but with local solutions and the scale of um, efforts are the scale of uh, knowledge dissemination that's required for us to, you know, move ahead and create a better world for all of us. Um, require solutions like Be Waste Wise, where you know we can put a panel together um, real fast, and then we can, you know, get all the marketing material and everything done in a half a day with, you know, really low costs. And then we can um, organize something like this with people from all around the world joining in to, you know, hear about um, these experiences from across the world. And something that we've observed over and over again is even though the kinds of solutions people take are different, um, but when you hear others who have uh, solved the problem, you get better idea on how you can do it yourself. So uh, we believe that this kind of model is really useful. And uh, if you have expertise, uh, reach out to us. Let's work together. We are a nonprofit and we are interested in investing in our collective future together. So uh, thanks for that and uh, have a good day, um, good evening, good morning, and I'll have a good night um, here in India. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much.